Where is everyone? Movies would have you believe that life is pretty likely, and it's not all that different from us. That there are loads of civilizations in the universe, and it's just a matter of time until we find one of them. But the sheer population of celestial bodies met by the deafening silence of the cosmos makes us ask, where is everyone? Is something stopping intelligent life from advancing? I'm Ashley Christine, and here's how it works. The Great Filter was a concept first coined by economist Robin Hansen in 1996 about a barrier of some kind that blocks civilizations from becoming too advanced to reach the kinds of levels we see in Star Trek or Star Wars. The filter could be anything, an asteroid, a virus, or self-destruction, something that prevents civilizations from developing the ability to cross the cosmos. Whether or not we've successfully passed this proposed filter or yet to face it has been hotly debated. Life as we know it is carbon-based which makes sense. Carbon is the fourth most common element in the universe, just behind oxygen. Even Mars's atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide, and Venus is about the same. Carbon is everywhere, which is convenient for us. If life is to thrive and reproduce, it will need to be made of an element that is readily available so that it can grow and be sustained. But going from basic carbon compounds to sentient beings at Taco Bell is a step we don't fully understand. One idea is abiogenesis, which was introduced in the early 20th century and it suggests that life arises from non-life. Now, this isn't the same as the theory of spontaneous generation from ancient Greek times, where wrapping cheese and bread in rags could produce a complex organism. Abiogenesis is simple life gradually becoming more and more complex over long periods of time, not maggots being birthed from bread. How life starts as a basic life form and progressively increases in complexity over time, and how often this happens in the universe, is something that we're still trying to figure out. On Earth, single-celled organisms appeared around 700 million years after the Earth formed, which is pretty fast. The soupy sludge lived in hostile conditions and relatively abundantly, leading us to assume that life doesn't need much once it gets going. However, jumping from single-celled organisms to something more complex like an animal that can think is an entirely different challenge. Life, by the most basic metric, may have developed in a few hundred million years, but it would take over three billion years more for that to evolve into multicellular organisms. And that's on a lush and vibrant planet like Earth. The reason for this is complexity. It takes a lot for cells to coordinate and cooperate and find a beneficial enough reason to work together and become something new. And single-celled organisms were doing pretty well on their own for a long time. Basically, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But luckily for us, at some point, they became team players. These communal benefits appear to be a theme on every layer of life, even all the way up to civilization. Whether it's single-celled organisms organisms deciding to upgrade their game, red blood cells working with white blood cells, or that group project due on Friday and someone hasn't submitted their portion yet, could cooperation be both the key to life and its downfall? The Great Filter is the idea of a cosmic balance that, from the earliest moments of abiogenesis to the high levels of civilization on the Kardashev scale, which we'll discuss in a bit, it is exceedingly difficult to detect life. That civilizations struggle to advance past a certain point, or maybe they don't pass it at all for whatever reason. It could be an asteroid, the host star dying of old age, or some other leveler that we have yet to see. There are two basic scenarios. Either the filter is ahead of us, or it's behind us. If it's behind behind us and unbeknownst to us, we already passed the test, then life is rare and we are the first or one of the first to succeed. It could have had nothing to do with us like the jump from single-celled organisms to multicellular millions of years ago, or it was directly by our own hand when we created the internet and built spaceships and managed every day not to wipe ourselves out with nuclear weapons. If we pass the test, the filter, then that's tricky because it means that there isn't much else out there, or maybe only a few other civilizations pass the test, or more optimistic Realistically, we're the first of what will be a golden age of civilizations across the universe, and other planets will catch up with us in a few hundred million years. Maybe this is just how long it takes for a galaxy to cultivate a viable crop. The other scenario is that we have not passed the filter. It's ahead of us. That is the most concerning because it means that life is pretty common, but no one survives it. It means that we're rushing toward the filter and have no idea what we're about to face. Every generation has their moment of thinking that the world is going to 
end. But the difference now is that we could actually do it. Some scientists believe that we are in what's called a window of peril, a period of time where we have the capacity to destroy ourselves in a way that wasn't really possible before. One person presses a button and they could single-handedly be responsible for killing what may be the only life in the universe. These are the thoughts that keep me up at night. In a paper published by NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in 2021, they theorized that humans could potentially be a spacefaring species before we destroy ourselves, somewhere within the next few hundred years. Basically, if we're not all in the same place, we're not all bound to the same fate. In the study, they created a model that predicted the earliest launch dates for manned missions to other planets within our solar system and outside of it. They used the relationship between the complexity of a deep space mission and the advancement of computing power. How fast your phone's evolving. The model predicted that the first manned missions to Mars would happen sometime in the next 15 years, Jupiter and Saturn in the next 50 to 60 years, and our closest star system, Alpha Centauri, just over 200 years. If we are able to dodge our own self-destruction, what would it take to spread across the galaxy? The Kardashev scale was a five page paper and purposefully not complicated so that the public could easily visualize it. These aren't just random numbers, these are based on energy use. The original scale came in three classifications, but with some being added later. In this video, we'll just focus on the first three. A type one civilization is a planetary civilization, meaning that it can harness all of the available energy on its planet, even control the weather. That would mean harnessing all solar energy that hits us, wind, water, and even minerals. You might think this is us, but it's not. Estimates put us at around 0.72. Burn all the gas you want, but it can only burn so bright. Its output is nothing compared to, say, nuclear energy, which produces millions of times more energy than fossil fuels. It will probably take us another 100 to 200 years to become a fully type 1 civilization. A type 2 civilization is a stellar civilization, meaning that they can harness all the available energy of their host star. These are civilizations like the Federation in Star Trek. They can hop from star system to star system. It's basically impossible to wipe these civilizations out. They're so spread out. If an asteroid were heading toward them, they could eliminate it. A war, they could leave it. Hurricanes, famine, drought, there is nothing they couldn't manage because they have enough disposable energy to make them immune to extinction. The jump from a type 1 to a type 2 is massive. This is 10 times the amount of energy consumption of a planetary society. And that's not even us yet. It's difficult to imagine the kind of technology that could harness that kind of power, but one theory is a Dyson Sphere. It's a megastructure of solar panels or collectors that surround a star and capture the majority of its energy output. First proposed by physicist Freeman Dyson, not this one, it could be a method for a civilization to meet its enormous energy needs, since a planet would not be able to match that. The design could be a solid shell, but due to the gravitational might of a star, the shell would be constantly bombarded by asteroids and space debris, leaving it vulnerable to cave-ins. Not to mention, this would be an insane amount of material. To cover an entire star, let's say from the distance of Mercury, would require the mining of every planet and rock in the solar system. And even then, it's not enough to fully seal it. More realistically, it would be a set of rings or a Dyson swarm, which would require way less material. This is what scientists believe might be our best method to detecting other civilizations. Life needs energy and stars are the engines of the universe. A type 3 civilization is a galactic civilization. This is the empire in Star Wars and even some of those groups like in Ahsoka where they go to a completely different galaxy. This is a civilization that can easily cross the galaxy and harness all of its energy. The universe is their oyster and they have 10 times the energy consumption of a type two civilization. Our movies make it seem like this kind of thing is within proximity, but it is absolutely not. It would take us well over 100,000 years to reach this. But if the galaxy is over 13 billion years old, doesn't that allow waves upon waves of other civilizations to rise? rise and fall over the years, just as they rise and fall on Earth. Shouldn't we have at least then caught signs or the archaeological remains of at least just one great empire that survived the Great Filter? 
We have the tendency to think that if life is in the universe, then surely it will come to us. But the odds are that no one knows we're here. For billions of years, Earth was a silent rock floating in the vastness of space like any other rock. It made no noise and flashed no signals of life. It wasn't until the 1800s when Earth began to emit signals. It was May 13th, 1897, and Guglielmo Marconi sent the world's first radio message across the UK, paving the way for decades of noise. What we now call radio. Radio waves, like every wave on the electromagnetic spectrum, travels at the speed of light. You might think that means our voices and songs have reached pretty far, but 200 years is only this little speck of space right here. When the rest of the galaxy turns their telescopes toward Earth, depending on how far away they are, they're seeing simple hunter-gatherers, maybe the rise of Egypt. They're not seeing us as we are today. Remember that light takes time to travel, and light is what carries images of us. So what civilizations around here see is us tens of thousands of years ago. And another galaxy? Pfft, they're seeing dinosaurs or nothing at all. And that goes both ways. If we see a planet on the other side of the galaxy, we don't see it in real time either. We're seeing them as they existed tens of thousands of years ago and millions of years ago for other galaxies. If the Great Filter is real and there's some natural barrier preventing civilizations from spreading across the cosmos, then the real question is if whether or not we've past it. Maybe we did. Maybe it's racing toward us. Or maybe there's no filter at all. And there are a bunch of civilizations living on planets and moons across the cosmos, and we're just not catching each other at the right time.